Hey, internet friends. If the world is a kaleidoscope of color, you and I could be looking at the same sky and see totally different shades of blue. Reality is much the same. In the Israeli-Palestinian conflict with its complex and winding history, is one of those reality breakdowns where people come away with drastically different reads of the room. Based on their upbringing, religious affiliation, schooling, television habits, you know how it is. Only, much like COVID and even the war in Ukraine, we are being forced to choose a side. And it's not simply a selection, but a moral decree. An effective way to shatter the calm of the evening is to have an opposing opinion on this issue amongst good company. So today I'm going to give you a historical overview of the Israel and Palestine conflict that is seldom taught in school or even church to better help us navigate the barrage of violent imagery, harrowing headlines, and narratives meant to stir not only emotion, but serve as a call to action. Let's start with the basics. Judaism isn't Zionism. While Zionism is a political philosophy for a certain group of people, Judaism is a religion. Jewish ancestry is not a requirement for practicing Judaism. To be a Zionist, you don't have to be Jewish. The official definition of Zionism is a movement for originally the reestablishment and now the development and protection of a Jewish nation in what is now Israel. Zionism was established as a political organization in 1897. Basically, Zionists believe that according to the Torah, God made a covenant or a sacred agreement with the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs of Judaism. So in the Old Testament, as it's interpreted by Zionists, God basically acts as a real estate agent and promises Abraham and his descendants a specific land, often referred to as the promised land or the land of Canaan. The land is described in various passages in the Bible and includes the territory that makes up modern-day Israel, as well as parts of surrounding areas. If you're new here, I'm from the Bible Belt of the United States, where Christian Zionism is widespread. Believe in that Israel and the Jews are the chosen people and that Israel is the promised land for Jews is taught in church as a gateway to salvation and eternal life. Keep in mind that as Christians, we are also taught that the way to eternal life and salvation is through Christ, whom religious Jews reject, and they also reject the idea of hell or eternal damnation. And I just want to remind Christians who might be watching that everything changed with the New Testament, which is why Christians are taught from both the Old and New Testament. Remember, Jesus rolled up, started performing miracles, flipping over tables of money changers, and said, it doesn't matter who you are, how much money you got, who your daddy is. As long as you walk with Christ, you're chosen for eternal salvation. And this changed everything. It gave everyday people hope and put them on an even playing field. There's point of view where we don't believe in the divinity of Christ. I right. think that the, there you can make an argument that the the gospels which were written. He was just a prophet. In, right? No, no, no. We don't uh, even believe he was a prophet. What do you think he was? What do you guys I, think I mean, I, what, I, what do I think he was historically? I think he was a Jew who tried to lead a revolt against the Romans and got killed for his trouble. But just like Christians, there are certain sects of Judaism that believe one thing and other Jews believe something else. So Jews who follow the Babylonian Talmud, a rabbinical text, are taught that there is a distinction between Jews who are considered the chosen people in Jewish theology and those who are not Jewish. The word used to describe the non-Jewish, including Christians, is goyim or goy. It is a derogatory Yiddish term meaning cattle or beast, often used in place of the word Gentile. And this distinction, or this perception, well, it just totally discards the concept of an even playing field. The perception of the self, the teachings, are inherently otherly in ways that others could never achieve if they weren't born into it. The first big departure from Israel happened during the Babylonian exile, almost 600 years before Christ when King Nebuchadnezzar II of the Babylonian Empire took over Jerusalem and destroyed the first temple, Solomon's temple. Then Rome conquered Jerusalem in 70-ish AD, destroying the second temple, the central hub of Jewish worship and sacrifice. About 70 years later, the Romans changed the name of the area from Judea to Palestina. Okay, so like I said, the original Bible Jews fled Judea to surrounding areas throughout the centuries. 
But there's a key event that happened in Jewish history that no one really ever addresses. And I'm just going to warn you, it's a highly debated event. It really gets people worked up to talk about it. During the Middle Ages, between the 7th and 10th centuries, the kingdom of Khazaria ruled over parts of Russia, Kazakhstan, and modern-day Ukraine. So under the Khazarian Empire, the kingdom made all the civilians who were reportedly polytheistic and pagan, they made them convert to Judaism. And it's believed that the decision to convert was a political choice to stay independent and avoid religious pressures from the Christian Byzantine Empire to the west and the Islamic Caliphate to the south. Meaning that Khazarians were not necessarily Jews in the sense that Bible Jews were, if that makes sense. They had the identity, but not the connection to ancient Israel. After the fall of the Khazarian Empire in the 10th century, Khazarians migrated and integrated across Europe. In all fairness, it should be noted that a bunch of Jews call the Khazar history a conspiracy theory. They say it's an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. Even though you can open up a history book and it's right there, so I don't know what to tell you. Chinese Muslims don't pretend they're Arabs, but white Europeans claim to be Bible Israelites, and we all just pretend that's perfectly normal. Eventually, Jewish people arrived in Western Europe and America, and forgive me because it's getting a little dicey here, making the distinction between Bible Jews and converted Jews, but apparently it's an important distinction because it determines whether America is willing to send billions of tax dollars and soldiers to a nation. So we've got to at least touch on the difference. So let's fast forward to the late 1800s when Zionism allegedly got its start in response to the resurgence of anti-Semitism. By the way, anti-Semitism before the definition was changed in like 2016 used to mean hostility towards Semites. A Semite being a member of any of the peoples who speak or spoke a Semitic language, including in particular the Jews and the Arabs. Now it just means hatred of Jewish people. When Zionism was just getting traction, among the considerations for a Jewish state were Argentina, Uganda, Cyprus, and even Texas. Throughout the early 1900s, numerous Zionist groups began to pop up across the United States, with their various publications serving as a vehicle for Zionist propaganda. The goal was to influence both the United States Congress and the general public. Though the sentiment amongst U.S. officials at the time was that Zionism countered both U.S. interests and principles. Since it involved matters related to other countries other than the United States. Clearly, much has changed since then. But then the world descended into war. A secret deal called the Sykes-Picot Treaty was made during World War I, the result of which was bringing down the Ottoman Empire. The treaty was made public in 1916 and set new borders for the Middle East splitting the area into states, and Palestine was put under international control. But strangely enough, the Balfour Declaration, which was written in a letter to Walter Rothschild by the UK's Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour, promised Palestine as a home for the Jewish people. And this letter was sent just one year after the Sykes-Picot Treaty. It's important to remember that the Rothschild banking family actively funded both sides of the war. This was also done during World War II because countries at war needed money to do things like feed and arm their men. But for Rothschild Zionism, making money was just the cherry on top. They needed Jewish people to be traumatized. They needed Jewish people to have a reason to live in fear and want to migrate to Israel, which would serve as a hub to help them rule the Middle East. And they needed global superpowers to back them up. But even before World War II, Zionists were busy buying up land in Palestine and moving there. Palestine was a place where Jews, Christians, and Muslims already lived. The Zionist Federation of Germany and the Nazi government signed the Havara Agreement in 1933. This made it easier for German Jews to move to Palestine, and it let Jewish people in Germany move some of their wealth out of Germany by buying things made in Germany to send to Palestine. Jews who had left their homes used the money they made from selling these goods in Palestine to settle down there. As a result of the deal, about 60,000 German Jews moved to Palestine before it was officially ended when World War II broke out in 1939. Before the State of Israel was officially established, the Palestinians revolted. Zionists said this was because of their anti-Semitism, 
but Palestine was their home, and the Arabs knew it was being attacked and taken away from them. Were they just supposed to, I don't know, give away their homes and family farms without a peep? Y'all like, oh, no problem, we'll just bulldoze our homes ourselves. That's just a little bit unrealistic, don't you think? 700,000 Palestinians were forced from their homes when the state of Israel was created. Some people might call this an ethnic cleansing of the land. More and more Palestinian land has been claimed by Israel every year since its creation. And every day there is a war. In 1967, Israel was at war with six surrounding Arab states. As a result, Israel won and took over the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, and of course, the Syrian Golan Heights. The UN has asked Israel to leave these lands to give them back, but they have held on to them, which has created extremely high tensions in the region, giving rise to extremist groups, which are then funded by the CIA and Mossad and whoever else, so they can control the opposition, which is always their MO. Zionists say that their treatment of Palestinians is okay because after World War II, everyone abandoned Israel. They were truly on their own and surrounded by people who didn't like them being there. The excuse for their aggression was that they were protecting themselves. After all, Jewish Zionists believe that they are God's chosen people and that this land was given to them by God and it's their duty, their manifest destiny, if you will, to take it. This argument, this whole argument has transformed into, do we not have a right to protect ourselves in the face of such extreme anti-Semitism? Let's call a spade a spade. It's all a bit gaslighty. As part of Zionism's manifest destiny, there is perpetual war and death in the Middle East. The United Nations doesn't punish Israel for their violations of human rights as they grow into the greater Israel. Even so, Resolution 3379 of the UN General Assembly in 1975 said that Zionism was a form of racism and racial discrimination. This decision was taken away in 1991. Still, it seems like Israel is a Jewish state, but only for a certain kind of Jewish people. The Palestinian Jews who were there the entire time and the Ethiopian Jews who moved there in the 1980s and early 1990s aren't wanted there. Bethlehem, historically associated with Jesus Christ, has seen its Christian population decrease significantly, from 80% in the 1920s to just 20% today. A similar decline has occurred throughout Palestine, where Christians now make up only about 1% of the population. Some people might say that this decline is because of tensions in the Middle East between Palestinian Muslims and Christians. However, however, a study from 2017 found that the main reason Palestinian Christians left was the pressure of Israeli occupation. The study reported that ongoing restrictions, unfair laws, random arrests, and land seizures are some of the things that make Palestinian Christians feel hopeless. Every day for decades, the Israelis and the Palestinians are at war with each other. Eventually, Israel put up a wall between territories, effectively surrounding the Palestinian population of 2 million like their caged animals, providing only a couple of guarded exits. Palestinian civilians often get caught up in the crossfire, leaving their hospitals, schools, and homes destroyed by Israel. Meanwhile, Israel built their Iron Dome missile defense system in the 2000s to defend against rocket threats from Hezbollah and Hamas. The United States funds both sides of the conflict, giving Palestinians $600 million annually and Israel around $3.3 billion in foreign aid annually. To wrap it all up here, Israel has and continues to commit human rights violations against Palestinian civilians, which have been documented by the UN and human rights organizations. There are repeated examples, daily tragedies that global superpowers have turned a blind eye to. Presumably in the United States, it's because the Zionist lobby has a great deal of power over the politicians. Any criticism of Israel and its practices gets shut down by accusations of anti-Semitism before one sentence ever leaves your mouth. And of course, the Palestinians hate the Israelis. Of course, the Israelis hate the Palestinians. Who is right? Who is wrong? Do you actually believe that the same media who lied to get us into every major war, Vietnam, the Gulf Wars, into the war on drugs, Intact passports at the bottom of the Twin Tower rubble, war on terrorism, COVID, mass saves lives, Ukraine, 
Do you actually believe they're telling you the truth about what happened in the last few weeks between Israel and Palestine, the events of which will inevitably escalate and lead to greater involvement of global superpowers and eventually cost the lives of many American soldiers? Do you actually believe that they're telling you the truth? If everything went down exactly as the media reported, of course Hamas is in the wrong for killing Israeli civilians. The whole sophistication of the Israeli intelligence and military surveillance apparatus being down during that particular time is a little suspect, but I digress. I hope that if you're a Christian, you'll consider what I've said. I know you're good people. I know you have big hearts, and I know you hate to see others suffer. But if you're going to cheer on the genocide of an entire population and beg for Americans to get involved, I hope and pray that you know the true identity and intent of our greatest ally in the Middle East. Because by your logic, you're basing your entire eternal salvation on supporting them and their actions. Just make sure that you're sure. That's all. By the way, I wish we had a single politician who was as fired up about what's happening in the United States as they are about Israel. Wouldn't that be something? What if people directed their energy towards bankers and puppeteers funding both sides of the conflict instead of choosing a side in this false dichotomy? What do you think, internet friends? I'm sure I've upset some of you by saying this. I just humbly ask for your consideration of what I've laid out here and... You know, I contemplated a long time about doing this video, and I still felt like after a week it was important enough to post. Relaying this type of information is not something I take lightly. But anyway, thank you for your time, thank you for subscribing, and thank you for buying my book, The Deep State Encyclopedia. Bye!